It's very good to be here with you this evening. Thanks, Stuart, for loaning me his computer to do my presentation on. What I have doesn't connect to the, uh, the system here, so we're using his instead. You can see what I have on uh, the chart there, a chronology of Acts placing its events in historical perspective. So what I want to talk about this evening is something that I, uh, I got involved in about five, six years ago and I wanted to do a study in the life of the Apostle Paul. And one of the first things that I kind of looked into was, of course, the book of Acts is, is the rich treasure trove of, of Paul's activities. Where exactly did these things fit in in the timeline of history? Because uh, when you read in the book of Acts, it's often difficult to understand exactly how much time has elapsed before certain events occur. And a good illustration of that, if you've never noticed it before, read in Luke as he describes the events after the resurrection all the way to the end of the book. And then ask yourself, how many days did that take? And then go back and read the first chapter of Acts where he goes over some of those same, same events and then he discloses to you that some of the things he said in Acts without pointing it out to you actually took 40 days to occur. But if you didn't know that, you would think they were all on the same day because what Luke was writing in the Gospel of Luke, he wasn't concerned at that point with giving us a detailed calendar accounting, but he was more concerned about the things that occurred, not necessarily when they occurred. Now, one of the things about the Western mindset, the modern mindset, is we're a very time-driven people. You know, we, we want to know exactly when did it happen. We want to know, uh, you know the, the chronological view. If you read a biography of somebody, a modern written biography, very often it's basically a chronological view of what happened in their life, not a topical view of this aspect of their life, and then we'll come back and talk about this other aspect of their life. Well, when we're looking in Acts, it isn't that clear also, but the timeline is. And so, what I decided to do for my own interest in edification was to talk about the chronology of Acts. How much of the, the things that are written there can we put onto the calendar and say, this is where that occurred? And what I found was, Paul was obviously a very incredibly busy person. But when you read all the things that you read in Acts about the activities of Paul and all the epistles that he wrote, when you realize how compressed of a time that that was, it's even more impressive, and I hope to share that with you this evening. So why does it matter what we're about to study? Well, number one and two, it helps demonstrate the truthfulness of Scripture. You know, if you look at um, the critics of Scripture, oftentimes they will try to point out inconsistencies or what they see as inconsistencies, and they will latch onto that and say, well, there you go, the whole thing is, un is, is a fraud. And several of those over the years have been in the book of Acts. One of them was the, the title that was given to a certain uh, official on, on a, we'll talk about it in a little while. The title was not known anywhere before and it was said to have been a mistake. Lo and behold, they found an architectural uh, piece of granite that had that title written on it in that city. They'd never heard of it before, but there it was. Um, so the word is politarchs. I think, I think it's in this presentation where I talk about that in detail, but that's what the word is. It was never heard of before. But once they found that word in the dirt on a piece of stone, they knew that, yes, it did exist, and Luke was correct when he used that term in that place, in that time. As a matter of fact, if Luke hadn't been there at that time and written it, he couldn't have known it existed because the term was not used all that long. So little things like that become very interesting to me. And so it helps demonstrate the truthfulness of Scripture, and it also puts the rest of the New Testament writings in a better context. When was 1 Corinthians written? When was 1 Timothy written, 2 Timothy? When were these epistles actually put down on paper? What's the context in which they were written? How long was it between Paul's visit to Thessalonica before he wrote 1 Thessalonians? How long after that did he write 2 Thessalonians? You can get a pretty good framework if you start puzzling through the pieces. And it makes some of it, I believe at least, more, um, more, 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 makes more sense. And of course, to me, it's interesting. I like doing this kind of stuff because I found it to be interesting. So the world of Acts, uh, you know, over here is Jerusalem, of course. And if you're not really familiar with the map, I assume that you are from the back of your Bibles. But this is the world of the book of Acts. And this actually extends a little bit further off the charts on the left side over there. As um, Paul talks in Romans about wanting to go to Spain. And indications are that he may have made it that far, which puts him all the way over to the edge of the Mediterranean in the area of Spain. But this is the part that you read about 
in the book of Acts, the, the, the journeys of Paul and the people who, who his companions might have been, you know, they went to Cyprus, they went all over what is now modern day Turkey, up into the area that was Macedonia and the part that's Greece today, part that's uh, um, named here as Achaia, the province back then, all the way to Italy. These were the areas that we read about in the book of Acts. Those are not short distances. Those are not easy distances to travel in. We must not lose sight of the fact, and I'll mention this a little bit later on, they didn't get into a car, they didn't get on a bus, they didn't get on a plane. They oftentimes got on a boat, perhaps. But if it was over land and you were the Apostle Paul, it was your feet that took you where you were going for the most part. And there's a lot of mountains and things in these areas they had to traverse. So it was hard going, and it wasn't something that happened overnight. So this is the world of Acts. We're going to notice a little bit more as we go into our little study this evening. First, what I want to do is talk about the Roman emperors just briefly. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time with them, but I wanted to make the point that these are the rulers of the known world. And these were not, uh, you know, uh, super people. It seems like um, their names are well known, but not for good reasons oftentimes. They were not exceptional individuals intellectually for the most part, but they were ordinary people who circumstance whatever they might have been, whether they were born into something or whether they were adopted into something, they became uh, men who wielded great power. And because of the power that they wielded, and we can't really conceive of it in our modern time, there's no king in our recent memory even that has the kind of power that these emperors were able to wield, where they could literally give an order and people would, without even questioning, go and sever somebody's head without any due process rights. Just because the emperor said, you're dead, I'm coming to your house and we're going to kill you. That kind of power. These were ordinary men who wielded tremendous power. And so if you were a Christian in this time period, you were aware who was in charge. And you were aware if uh, if they were uh, um, favoring, accepting of, tolerating Christianity, or whether they were uh, disfavoring Christianity, and it affected your daily life. It affected everything that you might have done in your life. So we're going to look at the period from 14 AD to 79 AD and just run through who were the emperors? Who were they and in order? The first one would be Tiberius Caesar. This is just a picture of a statue that was made of him. You know, if you're going to be the emperor of the, of the, of the world, you have to have a statue. So Everybody could know who you are, what you look like, and so they had statues made of themselves throughout their their reigns, and they were just distributed throughout the empire and placed in the temples and other places for people to venerate them. They didn't always worship them as gods. That came later, but they always venerated them as the ruler of the known world at that point, I guess. And uh, this is just an example of the tribute money. This was the man who was the Caesar when Jesus said, show me the tribute money. They said, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not. They were saying, is it lawful to pay taxes to Tiberius Caesar or not? So Jesus says, show me the tribute money. This is the one that would have been coined by him. They could have been any others as we often have old coins, but this would have been the most current one at the time of Tiberius. Now what I'm gonna do as I go through these, I'm gonna mention to you how many years they reigned up at the top from 14 to 37, 22 years. And then I'll also mention to you how they died, and what age they were. So he died by being smothered. Now you would think that if you were the emperor, you had the Praetorian Guard to protect you, you were going to have a nice easy life. Well, in the case of Tiberius, it ended rather abruptly. He was smothered. And in his place began to reign a uh, a relative of his, a very young man at the time, whose name is Caligula, as we know him today. He reigned for a period of four years. One thing that's important about Caligula that I want to notice is not the the horrible lifestyle that he is reputed to have practiced, but during his reign, he gave the city of Damascus to a man named King Eretus of a kingdom named Nabatea. This is the, the, the kingdom that has also the city of Petra in it. You've probably heard the city of Petra. This is that kingdom. And he did it around the year 37, 38 AD. And that's important, as we'll notice later on, the fact that this happened. And it's just coincidentally convenient for us that uh, he gave Damascus to King Eretus 
around this year, but also that King Eretus only had control of Damascus for a very few years until he died. Because now we have a linchpin from Acts that we can apply, and we'll notice that in a little bit. So Caligula, uh, a very uh, vile man by any measurement, died by assassination. His own Praetorian guard, his bodyguards, turned on him and executed him because he'd gotten so out of control and he was so unstable that everybody feared for their lives. Because what would typically happen is these uh, men would, for one reason or another, begin uh, killing off their enemies. And after a certain point in time, everybody began to fear, am I the next enemy? And then the inevitable would happen. Self-preservation sets in and people come back and say, you're going before I do. So somebody executes the man, which is what happened here. He was assassinated at the age of 28. In his place began to reign Claudius Caesar. I might also mention, I thought this was interesting, that these statues that I'm showing here that are colorized, it's actually a a newish thing. You can Google this later on if you want to, but people are beginning to conclude that all these statues that that we've been seeing uh, unclothed in white marble since the Renaissance period is a mistake. And in their prime, and when they were actually being used, they were painted. They've able to, been able to find traces of paint on many of these statues. That they originally were painted, so they didn't look like a piece of white marble. They might have looked like this. And often the statues that we see today in the museums with no clothes on actually had a literal garment wrapped around them. And the statue, as we think of it today, is much like in the, in the, in the department store where they have the clothes on the mannequin. And what we've been seeing is the the mannequin with no clothes on and thinking that's what they all saw back in those days. Well, now they're starting to wonder if maybe that might not have been the case. So anyway, colorized versions when I was able to find them on the internet. So Claudius Caesar, he reigned for 16 years. He is the one that expelled all the Jews from Rome. Priscilla and Aquila had to leave the town. I have forgotten the reason in the last five years since I put this together why he would have done that if it's even known exactly what was going on. But they believe, I I remember correctly, it was some unrest associated with Christianity and Judaism. And his not understanding completely what Judaism and Christianity were uh, different, how they were different, he just expelled everybody out of town. Everybody leave. We might say today, everybody out of the pool, just, just get out of here. And then some years later, they were allowed to return. The other thing is that's uh, notable in his reign is there were many famines in various places during his reign. And we notice, notice in Scripture, there's, in the book of Acts, there's many famines that are mentioned. This was that time period. He died being poisoned by his wife. Not his first wife, but one of his wives. Um, he was age 63, and she poisoned him because she wanted to put on the throne her son, Nero. You've heard the name Nero, I'm sure. Nero reigned for 13 years. Now, he would have been the person who was the emperor at the time that Paul said, I appeal to Caesar. And then he's told, you've appealed to Caesar? To Caesar you shall go. This is the Caesar that he was going to. He was later rumored to have been involved in the burning of the city of Rome. And some controversy even today, whether he was responsible for it, But whether he was responsible for it or not, he took great advantage of it and cleared off the rubble of what was left of the city and the spot he wanted to build and had a huge palace constructed, which is there even today. If you haven't happened to visit the city of Rome, part of it is still standing, Nero's palace. And that fire became the catalyst for Christian persecution by Rome. Now, uh, I believe it's Fox's Book of Martyrs recalls how that Christians were um, treated by Nero at this time after that. And the story goes that Nero sort of um, did a wink and a nod and let somebody create the fire through arson, or he did very little to stop the fire and celebrated it. But then the political backlash was, was tremendous. Everybody was blaming him because he did nothing to stop the fire, and it raged for weeks before they were able to get it put out, and a much part of the city burned to the ground. And everybody was furious at Nero. So he looks around and says, uh, It was the Christians that did it. He starts blaming the Christians for some reason. And enough people bought into that that it gave him the political clearance, if you will, to begin persecuting them openly. So in the area of Rome itself, the mainland of Italy, Christianity began to be physically persecuted and it was uh, was dangerous to admit out loud that you were a Christian for a time in the reign of Nero towards the end of his reign. But... As with several others, he displayed uh, a a lot of 
what you might think of as insanity traits. And um, before the Praetorian Guard could find him, he was hiding from them, and they zeroed in on where he was, and so he committed suicide to prevent them from killing him. So a not a happy ending for Nero. But what happened in the wake of Nero's death? A very strange thing. It's referred to in history as the year of the four emperors. There were four men who vied for position. It was a civil war throughout the Roman Empire as four different people tried to uh, achieve the, the emperor's status and hold on to it. A man named Galba, a man named Otho, and a man named Vitellius for various amounts of time in different parts of the empire were claiming to be Caesar. And if you had a Roman army at your beck and call that could defend you and hold that long enough, you would be the Caesar. They fought each other, and one of them would win, one of them would lose, and then that man's gone. Otho, for example, lasted three months before somebody else came and battled with him, and he lost. But when it, everything was all said and done, um, Galba had been assassinated, Otho had committed suicide, and Vitellius was assassinated by the soldiers that he was commanding, and the one who was the winner at the end was a man named Vespasian. Vespasian ruled for 10 years. Now, I didn't point this out to you, but if you look at all the other pictures, he's the only one smiling that I could tell. And if you read about him, he actually did have a very nice disposition, a very nice demeanor. And um, he was the one, reading in Josephus, who was waging war in Judea against the city of Jerusalem. He had sieged this, besieged the city and was in the process. When the legions heard what happened with Nero, heard what was going on in the Civil War, and the legions declared him the emperor, and he was beloved by all the troops everywhere, and they immediately said, yes, he's the one. So he went back to Rome to claim the title and left his son Titus to finish the war. So Titus destroyed Jerusalem, put an end to the Jewish national existence from which it has never, ever recovered. He's the only one out of all those that died of natural causes. And I wanted to point that out, so it's all, in, all caps at the age of 69. He thought it was silly that the emperors had claimed some sort of divine status. And he jokingly said on his deathbed, I think I'm becoming a god, as he was passing away. And he was being silly, because that's the kind of a person that he was. He did not take himself seriously, which is why he was allowed to die of natural causes instead of somebody else killing him. Then his son, uh, Titus, became the next emperor. So now let's move on to the governors of Judea. Judea was an imperial province. Now, let me explain one thing. When the Romans, uh, when under Augustus Caesar, began to organize the empire, they had the, the, uh, the Roman troops, and they were uh, in, divided up into legions. And the strategy that Augustus Caesar came up with was, the Senate, you can have the power over these areas, and I will have the power with the legions over on these areas. And he claimed it was a check and a balance sort of a thing. But what he craftily had done was assigned all the areas that were not subject to much conflict, no legions. And so it was a senatorial controlled area. There was no legions there, just a very minimal presence. But all the other areas had full legionary uh, uh, presence and they were all under the direct control of the emperor. So he had the army at his beck and call in a sense. So Judea was an imperial province that had Roman legions assigned to it. It had a procurator appointed directly by the emperor and the title of the governor, the procurator, prefect procurator, changed over time, but it was essentially the same position, and there was no set term length. You got appointed to this position, and you stayed there at the pleasure of the emperor, as long as, in, in the case of Judea, as long as the Jews didn't send a bunch of people back to Rome complaining about you, and then convince the emperor that you were a, a problem and a troublemaker to get you out of there and put somebody else in, you were set. You could be there as long as you wanted to be there. So this is that type of a position. So let's go down the list. History records them for us, so we know who they are. The first was Valerius Gratus, A.D. 15 to 25, and then Pontius Pilate. Now, there's a name we understand. Followed by Marcellus. Now, Pontius Pilate was, you can imagine, can you imagine the Jews complained about him? They did. And he was sent back to Rome in disgrace. And while he was gone, there was a caretaker before Marullus could eventually come in. I just thought that was, this was interesting. They have found in, uh, I think it was Caesarea, a, a piece of marble that has written on it up at the top here. It's the word Tiberium. The T is missing. The bottom, it's P-O-N is missing, and then T-S Pilatus. So here's a 
stone inscription from the era, from the time that mentions Pontius Pilate and Tiberius Caesar. Not that we needed proof, but it's kind of interesting that it showed up. So after this Marullus reign, then King Agrippa reigned. And Judea was added to his dominion, and he was allowed to use the title king. We read that in Scripture because of King Herod, and we don't read a lot about that, but pay attention because that was not allowed to be used by anybody else. The Romans did not want anybody claiming to be a king. Very few people were allowed to continue that title. Agrippa was allowed to use the title the king. So that's going to come up to play in just a minute. Then after that, there was these series of people. Cuspius, Fatus, Tiberius, Alexander, Ventidius, Cumanus, and then, ah, Marcus, Felix, Portius, Festus. Those are two names we recognize from Acts. And then after them, there were these three more. Marcus Julianus was the one who was there when the city of Jerusalem was totally destroyed. What about proconsuls? Proconsuls of Cyprus and Achaia we know something about. Now, these were senatorial provinces, not imperial provinces, and so they had no Roman legions assigned to them. There were no armies where they were, just a, a more of a, like an ambassador would have at the embassy, an embassy guard, nothing more than that, very minor sort of a thing. And it was a procurator appointed by the Senate because it answered to the Senate. Different set of rules applied also. They said, you get a one-year term length. We're going to send you there for a year. If you don't mess up, we'll renew it for a second year. But if you mess up, we're going to kick you out and put somebody else in your place. That was the general rule. So the proconsuls of Cyprus. We know one. We can work backward from there to find the one that interests us. So this El Aeneas Bassus in AD 52, there's an inscription found, and the date is known because it references the emperor at the time. And so it, we, we can tell pretty much when this exactly was. And since we know the, the, the length of service of these men, we can go backwards and know that this was Julius Cordus, and this must have been the years of him. And then we come to Sergius Paulus, age, uh, and, and 48 to 49 AD. The dates are inferred because there's a record of him being in Rome in 47 AD. And so 48, 49 makes a lot of sense. That's the window of time. We're going to come back to that name in a moment. Lucius Sergius Paulus is his full name. Proconsul Paulus is mentioned on an inscription found on the island of Cyprus. So he's verified as there in the archaeological record. But interesting to me is there was a family estate of the Paulus family in Pisidian Antioch. Now go read in Acts. Paul does the first missionary journey. He's in the island of Cyprus. He meets Sergius Paulus. Sergius is converted. They leave the island of Cyprus and look at the geography. Where's the next city they make a beeline for? Pisidian Antioch. You think maybe Sergius said, I've got family up there. Why don't you go preach to them? Certainly seems reasonable to me. I thought that was an interesting connection. Proconsul of Achaia. This would be the area of Corinth. Lucius Junius Gallio Aeneanus. He was there from 51 to 52 A.D. Now, what's known as the Delphi inscription document refers to him by title during the reign of Emperor Claudius around the year 52 A.D. So we know that's about when he was there. And there's an example of the Gallio inscription in the, the letters up there. It's hard to see, but that says G-A-L-L-I-O-N. That's his, his form of his name. King of Nabataea, Eretus IV, the city of Petra is on there, as I mentioned earlier. Herod Antipas divorced his daughter in order to marry Herodias, who was his sister-in-law. So there was some bad blood there after that, you might imagine. So that's recorded by Josephus. And Eretus acquired control of Damascus around 37 AD, we mentioned earlier. That's going to be a key date for us in a moment. But he died in 40. So it was only a couple years there, you know, 38 to 40 or so, that he actually had control of this, this city of Damascus. So a summary of some known dates we talked about. We've known the reigns of the emperors. We know when Agrippa I died. King Eretus had control of Damascus. Sergius Paulus' proconsulship of Cyprus. Gallio's proconsulship of Achaia. Festus arriving in Judea and Felix leaving. We know when, burn, uh, when Rome burned. And we know when Jerusalem was destroyed. So we have some dates, if you will. So if you put a timeline together, and I've started in the year 30 over here and come to the year 70 of that first century. Let's just start sticking some things on here, for some, some places we can talk about. Well, Pentecost was the year 30. You know, uh, if you want to talk about that a little bit later on, we can, but it's not the year 33. It's the year 30. 
Jesus was actually born about 4 B.C., if that makes any sense. About the year 37, Eretus rules Damascus. Agrippa I died about the year 44. Sergius was proconsul in Cyprus in the year 48. Gallia was proconsul of Achaia in 52. And we have Felix and Festus transferring power about the year 60. We have Rome burning in the year 64, and then Nero dying about the year 67, and Jerusalem destroyed in the year 70. So connecting all that to the timeline, the murder of James and Peter in prison would be the first thing we could look at. The start of the first missionary journey, the date of the Jerusalem conference, as I've named it, that was that conference where they discussed the question of, was it required to be circumcised if you were a, a Gentile in order to be saved? Paul's trial before Gallio, Paul's arrest and his journey to Rome, and when was Acts written? At the end of all these things. So, murder of James and Peter being imprisoned. For Acts 12, verses 1 through 3, about that time, Herod the king, notice that title, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, and because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread. So we know what time of year it was, and we know pretty much what year it was because of Herod the king. Herod the king could only be a cripple the first at this time, and we are told here that it was Passover, the days of unleavened bread, or um, atonement, I said, that's a mistake on the PowerPoint. So read in chapter 12, verse 21 through 23. So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. And then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God and he was eaten by worms and died. Now Josephus mentions the same event and it, it doesn't say it in the same way, but he died shortly thereafter. The way that it's written here, you might, in, you might get the idea that he collapsed on the podium and was dead right there like, um, you know, like when Peter said something about a certain person who lied about how much money they, they kept. And it isn't like that. He actually languished for a time in a sick bed in misery before he died slowly. But he did die soon after that. And so we know that it was in that particular year and it was in that particular time of year. He died about the year 44 A.D., not long after I pass over there. I think it's the Day of Atonement is what he should have said. The date for the events recorded in Acts 12 is 44 A.D. So the first missionary journey began in Cyprus, as I mentioned earlier, and down in here in the area of Cyprus, and then I mentioned earlier about um, Pisidian Antioch, way up there where the Asia is, that's the first place that they really stopped at after they left Cyprus. Now, when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Now, Sergius Paulus was written by many other people to have been a very intelligent person, a very reasonable man, a very, uh, a, a, a very pleasant person to be around. He has a reputation of being a very reasonable person, so this description of him calling for them is totally consistent with what others outside of the Bible have written about him. So, oops. Sergius Paulus governed from 47 to 48, and it was already established on the island when they arrived, so the most likely date here is 48 A.D., you can make an argument plus or minus a little bit, but that seems to make close enough sense. Now, the Jerusalem meeting or the Jerusalem council, the dates here are based on the time of Paul's escape from Damascus, which he mentions to us in his, uh, in his writings. First, we find in Acts chapter 9, Saul confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this is the Christ. This is right after his conversion. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night, led him down through the wall in a large basket. So he escaped the city. Now later on, Paul wrote it this way. In Damascus, the governor, under Eretus the king, was guarding the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, desiring to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. So now we know it was under the reign of Eretus the king that this all happened. Exactly the time frame was zeroed in for us. And now we can go back and say uh, this next piece of information. When it pleased God to reveal his son to me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately go up to Jerusalem, 
to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So there was a second appearance in Damascus before he went to Jerusalem for that first time, he says. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jer Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. So he said it was 14 years had elapsed. So what we conclude, conclude here is it took 14 years from, after Paul's escape from Eretus IV before the Jerusalem conscience occurred. Now he only had control for this short period of time, as I mentioned earlier. And if we go much later than 37 AD and try to say it was during the later part of Eretus' life, that doesn't leave enough time for all the other events that are mentioned as occurring after the Jerusalem Council. So, and I was looking at this, I said, well, 37 seems to make sense. It's close enough for my purposes. So it's not a guarantee, but it's, it's pretty close. The most likely date is 37 plus 14 years that it took is the year 51 AD when the Jerusalem Council actually occurred. Second missionary journey, Paul and Silas began this trip not long after the Jerusalem Conference had concluded. Because it says, so when they were sent off with that letter after the conference, they came to Antioch. When they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. Everybody received with great joy the consolation that the letter offered, it says. And then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. So the idea to go back again came not long after they came back with that letter. So they go on this journey, and while they're in Corinth, then they meet proconsul Gallio. Acts chapter 18. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth, and he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. So we now, we have a, this is a short window of time when Gallio was there. He was proconsul of Achaia only from 51 to 52. The trial date then was most likely 52. Now, you could read this another way and conclude it's 51. You could read it like this. Uh, he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. And then when Gallio arrived and became proconsul of Achaia, a new change in leadership came along and then they decided to try their hand with him and try to get Paul in trouble, which would make it a year earlier, or 51 instead of 52. So you could take your choice on that one. It's not gonna change the dramatically anything that we're talking about, but it is interesting that you can piece that together a little bit. The second missionary journey, before he ever got to Corinth, they had traveled from Antioch of Syria down here following roughly this blue line all the way around to Achaia, which if you get out the map and look at it, was probably about 1,200 miles. You're not going to do that in a week. You're not going to do that in a month. It took some time to get that far. So the events of Acts 16 through 18 probably took place between 51 and 53 A.D., two or three years period of time that Paul was making this journey with uh, all the events that we find in those three chapters of Acts. Then he got arrested. So when did that happen? Well, we start from a known date and work backwards. So after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given him by Paul that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. But after two years, Portius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. So two years, and at the transition point where Felix and Festus are changing places, if you will, that's when he was uh, arrested two years earlier. So Festus succeeded Felix in 60 AD. Paul's initial arrest then was most likely in 58 AD. So Paul's journey to Rome did not begin until late autumn and then concluded in the following spring. We know this because it tells us in Acts 27 and verse 9, much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over. It was late in the year. It was past the time of sailing the Mediterranean safely. But then we read that when they arrived in Rome, after spending three months on that island, we sailed in an Alexandrian ship whose figurehead was the twin brothers who had wintered at the island. It was the springtime when the, the ships were able to get back out on the water safely once more when he arrived in, in, uh, in Rome. So he arrived at the spring of 61 AD. Paul was under house arrest for two years while awaiting trial. The best you can figure out from reading various sources and the, the, the laws of the time, 
He was a political prisoner charged with a political crime. He was not held as a murderer. He was not held as a thief. He was entirely a political, uh, religious persecution type of a thing. And the Roman authorities knew that. So they treated him with respect and, uh, and as they would do many other prisoners in a similar situation. He was not held in, in, in uh, literal chains and fed bread and water kind of a thing. But while he was there waiting for trial before Nero, he was allowed in his own rented home. He was under house arrest, you might think. He couldn't leave there, but he could receive guests. They could bring him money. They could bring him uh, things that would make his life more comfortable. They could bring him whatever they wanted to bring him. It was okay. And he was able to receive guests. And so that lasted for two years. Tradition has it, and the Bible seems to bear this out in some of the things that Paul wrote. After that, that two years, if your accusers did not arrive, trial did not occur, it was thrown out. The case was dismissed, and you were set free. Paul seems to have been set free after this. And there's a couple of reasons why that, that we won't get into this evening, but there are things that occurred that you can't account for in the book of Acts that Paul references in some of his epistles. So they had to have taken place after this period of time. So it makes sense from multiple ways of looking at it. Paul was released most likely in the spring or summer of 63 AD. So then when was Acts written? Well, it had to be written after the end of Paul's two years in Rome because the last thing it tells us is he stayed there for two whole years in the past tense. But there's no mention of a fire having happened in Rome, and that was in the year 64. That was a major, major event. You would expect that to be mentioned. There's no mention of Roman persecution of Christians, which resulted from the fire. Once again, that would be mentioned if it was something that had happened already. And there's no mention of Jerusalem being destroyed. That would definitely be mentioned, but it wasn't mentioned. So Acts is most likely written in the year 63-64 time frame prior to the great fire that destroyed much of Rome. So here's our timeline we started with earlier. Let's kind of plug in some things as we draw our lesson to a close from the book of Acts. First thing we can say is Paul was under house arrest. He was arrested in the year 58 based on everything that we've talked about. And then that imprisonment lasted. He was held prisoner in Caesarea for two years, sent to Rome and held there for two years. That's four years, so roughly about the year 62 when he was set free and uh, began to preach again. So that journey to Rome took place in the middle. So Acts 20, 20, chapters 21 through 24, 25 through 28, and chapter 28 all fell in this four-year period of time. And we can back up from there. We can see that Using the timeline that Paul gave us as far as the Jerusalem conference 14 years prior to that, etc., we can say that Paul was converted about the year 34, which is not that long after the day of Pentecost when the church was founded, just four years or so. So you can read the early part of the book of Acts, and you can say all of these events probably transpired in a very short period of time, just four years or so, maybe five years or so. James was beheaded and Peter was imprisoned, in the year 44, that was 14 years after the day of Pentecost. But when you read these events in Acts, you lose that sense of time. But here we can kind of give a, a sense of time here. Cornelius' conversion, Acts chapter 10, would have been about the year 35, 36. Of course, one through eight would have been the year 30 and up to the year 34. So one thing that really impressed me about this was Paul's first missionary journey began about the year 48. And he was arrested about the year 58. How many years is that? <laughs> That's 10. What did he get done in 10 years' time? Think about that. Read the epistles, read the book of Acts, and say to yourself, that was 10 busy years that Paul spent walking from here to there to here to there, devoting himself. And then read that passage where Paul recounts all the trials and things that he's gone through and when he says, perils of of brethren, but he also says perils of robbers, perils of rivers. He was talking about just making the journey was dangerous. And this is what he did and in only 10 years' time. Look how much ground he covered and how much, uh, uh, how much success he had in founding all these congregations and preaching the word and scattering the seed as he did. I'll leave you with this thought, which cannot be proven, but it's only speculation on my part. Paul wasn't the only person being busy during those years. There were 12 apostles. Paul was really 13 
What was Peter doing? Well, we know one of them was executed. He was beheaded. What about the others? They were just as busy, I'm convinced, in different places. Peter was sent to the Jews. Paul was sent to the Gentiles. We have the writings that tell us what Paul was involved in, but we don't know what the others were involved in. What was Andrew doing? Where did he go? They went somewhere. They weren't just sitting in Jerusalem staring at the ceiling. So there was, there was activity going on everywhere that they could go, fulfilling the commandment that Jesus had given to take the gospel to all creatures everywhere, to preach it all across the world. They were going where they needed to go, and they were very busy doing so. And you can just see from this one example here how much busyness there must have been going on in other places. And I leave you with that this evening. I hope that uh, the study has been some interest to you this evening, just in piecing it together and hanging it together on a calendar, on a chronology.